it's all right to talk with your mouth full. <laughs> I, uh, listen, go on with your coffee and your dessert and everything, but it's gotten a little later than I thought, and everybody's got things to do. First of all, I want to thank Bob Tuttle, who's come back here and is helping us for putting this all together. This is a very happy occasion for me, and I hope it is for, for all of you. A little more than two years ago, we were in the midst of a political campaign. You might remember. I want you to know that I'm deeply grateful for all of your dedication then and for all you've done since to help us accomplish what we set out to do. In a free society, change isn't something that's achieved by one individual. It's a process that depends on teamwork and cooperation of like-minded citizens. And of course, you've got to be selling something that people want to buy, and the change that we wanted to propose, I think they wanted to buy. I heard a story the other day on St. Patrick's Day, as a matter of fact, about an Irish priest that was going by a pub, and he saw three of his parishioners in there, and they were well in their cups and quarreling with each other and getting rowdy, and he went in, and he said to one of them, he said, stand over here. You want to go to heaven? Stand over here. And he stood over there. Said to the second one, he says, you want to go to heaven? Yes, stand over here. Said to the third one, you want to go to heaven? He said, no. He said, you don't want to go to heaven? He said, no. He said, you mean when you die, you want to go to the other place? He says, no, I want to go to heaven. Well, he said, why did, he said, I want to go when I die. He said, I didn't know you. I thought you were putting up a party to go now. <laughs> Two years ago, it wasn't my campaign that won the election, it was our campaign. And I'm pleased that you've been able to come here today for a discussion among friends of how far we've come and how much further we've got to go. Now, I know that you've heard that the Democrats have proposed an alternative budget. You must have been briefed on that today. All they're asking for is a reversal of the 1980 election. They seem to believe we can go right back to the same old pre-1980 policies and it won't bring back inflation, won't pull the rug out from under our economic progress or undermine our national security. Of course, they'd like to blame all the economic chaos and uncertainty that they can't cover up that happened before 1980 uh, on Jimmy Carter. But no one man could be responsible that could have caused all of our problems. The problems from which we're just now emerging the result of bad policies over a great many years. They control both houses of the Congress, all the departments of the executive branch, as well as the White House, for the last four years and for many of the years before. Even when there was a Republican president, except for one two-year period in which there was a Republican Congress, they, the pre Republican presidents, were up against uh, a majority of the opponents in both houses. Now, for a couple of years, uh, we've had one house at least, and thank heaven for that and for all of you for seeing to that, because we couldn't have accomplished any of what we've done if we didn't have that one house. Our adversaries, you'll remember, had begun counting us out in, uh, as a world power. The policies that I've been talking about that they had had given us inflation, sky-high interest rates, confiscatory taxation, a drop in real wages, and a sense that our country was in a national decline. Well, we've, we started out on the road together. We were all concerned Americans. We promised to make America great again, to not just change people, but to change policies to get control of federal go growth, and we've cut that by 40 percent. Promised to turn off the federal tax vacuum cleaner that was siphoning off everything in everybody's pockets. And we've achieved, by the end of this year, it'll be a 25 percent across the board tax cut. And even more important, a 1985 indexing will begin. And for all those people that are charging we're unfair, if someone hasn't told you already today, indexing is straight beneficial to the working man and woman. Because it's the thing that will keep people from getting a cost of living raise and then being moved up into a higher tax bracket, as we know. Well, it doesn't benefit the rich at all because they're already in the top bracket. 
It benefits those working people. 78% of the benefits from indexing will go to people with incomes below 50,000, down through the middle and down to the lower income rates. And uh, I can assure you with all of the talk that is on the other side of the aisle about possibly eliminating the third installment of the tax cut or indexing, I sleep now with a veto pen under my pillow. <laughs> Regulations, we know that everything, every element of our society was being strangled and under George Bush, he's been the head of a task force on regulations and we've cleared away many useless and counterproductive regulations. It has been estimated that the amount of paperwork we've saved, the people of the United States, with just the ones that have been cleared away so far, would total about 300 million man hours of paperwork a year that has been eliminated and uh, we're not through yet. One of the areas, of course, was, as I said, the declining prestige of our country, the neglect of our security needs. And now, as much as some would wish that it weren't so, a country's influence, its ability to maintain peace and preserve its freedom is dependent on its strength. And one fellow who occupied this house back around the turn of the century said it pretty well. The voice of the weakling, that was Teddy Roosevelt speaking, said, counts for nothing when he clamors for peace, but the voice of the just man armed is potent. We need to keep in a condition of preparedness, not because we want war, but because we desire to stand with those whose plea for peace is listened to with respectful attention. And uh, tonight I'm going to be spending about 30 minutes on ABC at 8 o'clock talking about this whole matter of defense, showing a few pictures that have been declassified for the, for the purpose. Now, I know when you come back here, you'd rather have dialogue than a monologue, so I'm going to put the rest of this back in my pocket. And uh, if any of you, as you probably have a time or two, have said, boy, would I like to ask him, uh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> you better, or I'll start making the rest of the speech. Tommy. <laughs> I'm bashful, Thomas, in Florida. <laughs> I just want to be sure, Mr. President, we're all confident that, you, that you're going to run, but we want to make darn sure that you know that the country needs you, the whole world needs you, and all of your supporters here. So <laughs> I know, I know that you've had explained to you why I can't say anything okay. about that right now, but as I've often said, it's the people who tell you whether you should or not, and I will remember uh, your response. <laughs> Someone else? Yeah. That wasn't a question exactly, though. Uh, yes. Well, I can tell you that we're looking at that as well as other things because most of us now are convinced that much of the people's objection to the taxes is not to the amount, but a lot of it is directed to the fact that uh, you can't figure out uh, what you owe the government. It is so com complicated. And there's a lot of truth in that. I don't know whether any of you have seen Time Magazine this week. They've got a whole article on the tax evaders. And I remember about 20 years ago, out of the mashed potato circuit, I made a speech once calling attention to the fact that back through history, every time a government began taking upward of 20% of the people's earnings, there began to be a disrespect for the law, an evasion of taxes, cheating, and no government had ever long survived taking more than a third of the people's earnings. Well, we've been way past that for some time now. You see, we can't just call the federal government. We've got to see what are taxes for our whole society, federal, state, and local. And they're up around 45 cents out of every dollar. Well, we've tried to make a dent, and we have made a certain dent uh, in that. But I think that what you're saying is uh, this is the thing that must be done, and it's made in that, in that article. They do a pretty good job 
of pointing this out, the complexities of the tax law, and the more complex it becomes, the easier it becomes for people to find ways to owe a tax and, and evade it. I'm not sure yet, we haven't studied enough to be able to say that the flat rate would be an answer. Uh, there, are, there are breaks that are given for, uh, some people call them loopholes, but others call them justifiable incentives. But we have to simplify the system, there's no question about that. It's the only experience you have in your life in which you owe something and the responsibility is yours to tell how much you owe, and if you don't tell it correctly, you get fined. And they, at the same time, tell you that their people have so much trouble with the tax laws that they can no longer uh, be trusted to advise you correctly on your tax problems. So uh, we're going to try to do something about it. Well, I think right now the interest rates could be lower on the basis of inflation. For the last six months, inflation has been running at 1.4 percent. Uh, there's no reason why they could not continue to come down to more. Real interest rates are higher uh, than they really have a right to be. But I think maybe, maybe Don didn't make himself clear because we've discussed this very problem. What has concerned him right now is that there has been it's very difficult, or maybe he told you this, to measure the money supply now with this whole new, all the new regulations that have permitted this transfer of money um, in great amounts uh, to the banks, uh, people out of money funds uh, to, uh, to just deposits in banks, and it's given a distorted view of uh, what is the, the state of M1. But, what my understanding is that he feels is the worry is that there has been a, a, something of a little surge and if we don't hold it and the money markets see that that is then going to be followed uh, by uh, having to, to, in other words, the up and down thing that they've been doing again. Like in 1980, the last six months, the money supply went up to the highest rate and the highest peak that it's ever been in our history. And then, of course, the interest rates were 21.5%, not because the money supply was that big, but because everybody knew they had to pull the string on it, and they did, right straight through 81, and you know what happened along about July of 81. Um, this is what he's really concerned about. He wants a, a kind of a, let's get and hold it more to level so that they won't be looking ahead and raising interest rates out of fear of, um, of the same old thing happening again. And with this, I have to agree, but I still say that I think the interest rates can come down. Incidentally, I had a little clipping from uh, Tucson, Arizona paper the other day for you gentlemen in the automobile business. 21 auto dealers out there got together and had an automobile fair in the city park. And they're still, their eyes are big as saucers still. They sold 825 cars in three days in this little town where they did this. President, I'm John Collins. Yes, I know, John. Well, I think we're always interested in hearing anything that we think will improve the situation. Uh, well, Mike, who should he who should he stay in contact with on that? 
Hmm? Don Regan. All right. Yes. I noticed the Washington Post had something that uh, it's a semi critical article about your moral position, uh, as, especially as it related uh, to good and evil as against our opponents in Rush Hour. The Washington Post? Well, if it was only semi critical, they're improving. <laughs> um, no, I know this is about a thing that, uh, in, in speaking to the uh, radio and the, the media evangelical preachers at their, their convention. And I did point out, as I have pointed out before, that the difference between us, and I use the term, that, uh, and, and in, the, in the whole context, they did seize that one line where I used the phrase, a focus of evil. And if you stop to think that what they're doing with regard to Afghanistan, what they do to their own people, their things, in contrast with society like ours, we are at the opposite ends of the pole. But uh, as you'll hear tonight, uh, we in, are in communication with them. Uh, I am not one who believes in the inevitability of war. I have always thought that that's one of the most dangerous things that happens is when someone looks at a potential enemy and finally just without themselves even being conscious of it, that their mind just accepts that someday we must fight. No. In the condition of the world today and the weaponry of the world today, that must not happen. And we're going to continue to try. But we tried, under previous administrations, detente. We tried saying, well, if we unilaterally will let our arms go, if we unilaterally will do these things for them, uh, then they will realize that we're nice people and they'll reflect that and they'll be nice in turn. And uh, we lost our shirts doing that. And what I have said and said to them directly, time after time, is no more words. We want to see some deeds that evidence that you are willing to rejoin the family of nations. And things will be a lot better for you if you do. And we're going to make every effort to keep on along that line. But some of it is frankly, as indirect diplomacy, uh, quiet diplomacy. To any government, including our own, if you suddenly make a demand of another government and you put it in the front page of the papers and say, by golly, they're going to have to do this, you've put them in a corner where they can't get out because of their own constituency, because it'll look like they're taking orders from someone else. So sometimes what you do is uh, quietly and behind the scenes, uh, you get someone to say to them, hey, uh, why don't you tell them that if they did such and such, my goodness, uh, we'd look very warmly upon that and we might find that uh, we were able to do something that uh, would be beneficial to them. And uh, here and there, there have been little evidences that uh, that can be successful. Mr. President, uh, I owned one of those dealerships in Tucson that had that great sale. Yeah. And you've done such a good job that I'd like you to get back to work. So maybe one, <laughs> one, one more question, and then we'll have the program. <laughs> well, um, there's two hands. I'll take the two. Right. Mr. President, I'm John Alderson from Virginia. We have a sore spot in this hemisphere for Christians. Yeah. Christians are We think we are, but we're having a great trouble with the Congress and with this whole worldwide propaganda thing about El Salvador that would seem to imply that we're either going to have a Vietnam or something. We haven't sent, they use the term advisors, we haven't sent advisors. We have sent men to train. We've trained a, three of their battalions up here, but that has become too costly and they can't spare that many men at one time in this conflict. But we think that they've made great progress. They're not, as, they're not up to the standards of human rights and democracy that yet that we would like. But the giant strides they've made when you think that not too many years ago, they have been for more than 50 years a military dictatorship. We believe what we're trying to get now is additional aid, uh, which had been cut back by the Congress uh, just this, this year. Uh, both for ammunition and supplies that they need and for economic help. Their economy 
we talk about it, it isn't all their fault. Uh, when those gorillas destroy a power grid and industries have to close down, uh, when they destroy bridges and they interfere with commerce and trade, their economy's been on kind of a yo-yo because of this. And there's no question, but they're getting those gorillas. These are trained professionals. That's a military body. These aren't angry peasants with a musket. They're out there better armed in many instances than the El Salvador Army. And the arms are coming in, flown in and by burrow on, on trails from Nicaragua. And they're from Cuba. Some of the earlier arms that went to the guerrillas were all American. And uh, some that we managed to get a hold of, we traced the numbers on them and found out they were coming from America by way of Vietnam. They were the things that were captured and abandoned by us in Vietnam. And uh, the communists sent them all the way around the world uh, to be used by the guerrillas in El Salvador. But our, we believe that this is regional. We believe that what we're seeing there, and we're not alone, uh, all those democracies that have come about, Honduras, Costa Rica, the others, all of them feel that they're next in line, that if El Salvador falls, joins Nicaragua, it goes all the way to the Panama Canal, and they say that the main target, and I believe it is, is Mexico, and then we would have a 2,000-mile border that we would have to defend. And uh, we just don't believe that we can afford to allow communism to get a foothold on the mainland of either North or South America or Central America. <laughs> Nothing. To simply have a meeting to get acquainted uh, makes no sense because the minute you announce such a meeting, expectations worldwide go very high. Then to just come home and say, well, I met him, uh, that's no good. It's too much of a letdown. So when we feel that there really is something and maybe out of the arms talks there will come a, a day, and if it could happen this year, fine, but if it doesn't, uh, possibly uh, early next year. Uh, I think it's inevitable we must have a meeting, and particularly because we're going to keep on hammering on these uh, arms reduction talks. Now, I know that I've overstayed the welcome, and I know that we're all going to come through in there in the other room, and I'm going to get a chance to say hello to each one of you, and we'll get a picture taken, and I know you've got to get going uh, right now, I see you're almost off the chair already. <laughs> okay, I'll take you first. Come on with me. And then the rest of Something you don't have time <laughs> Well, it'd be a little one yet. Charlie is Oh. Cole the other day to tell me I sent him the wrong size shirt for his birthday. <laughs> Jim Cole. <laughs> Hello, Mr. President. Thank you. Bill Evans. Raymond Heffern. Good. Seymour Holtz. Thank you. Frank Conway. Ken Rockstand. Ray Francis Graves. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Tom Rooney. Best to know you. Her partner. Thank you. Frank Potter. Yes. Norman Raymond. I'll think about that. <laughs> Douglas Hope. Mr. President. Thanks, John Oliver. Good to see you. Thank you. John Alderson. Fred Waterbarson. Fred Waterbarson. Thank you. Fred Waterbarson. Thank you. Fred Waterbarson. Thank you. Fred Waterbarson. Thank you. 